You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Traditional psychiatry, integrative medicine, or just someone to talk to, Dr. Carly is here to provide moms with personal solutions so that they may experience whole body, mind, and well being at this most extraordinary time of motherhood. Now, please welcome the host of MD for Moms, Dr. Carly Snyder. Welcome. You are listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. I'm a reproductive and perinatal psychiatrist, meaning I work with women struggling with emotional symptoms throughout their reproductive years. I am also mom to three children of my own. This show, MD for Moms, is dedicated to helping women enjoy life more, to maximizing health and wellness, and to improving women's relationships with themselves and with others. So throughout the show, I'm going to remind you that if you have a question, you can give us a call and ask live on air. The number is 866-451-1451. And we are continuing our Mama Docs on Call series where I introduce you to physicians who are also moms who are here to provide information and support that's geared to you and your family. And today's show... Is super interesting. It's going to focus, we're going to talk about diet, nutrition, and how our choices really both for ourselves, but also for our children can really have a lasting impact on health. And in the converse, if you find that you are someone who would like to be healthier, there are certain choices that you can make that can really speed up the process and make things easier versus kind of getting caught in um traps, food traps, let's call it that. Um, I'm super excited. I think this is such an important topic and one that, um, you know, picking food, it, it can be a little confusing sometimes, but I think it's really important to discuss it. Um, and we have not one, but two experts today, Dr. Alexandra Soa, who is from New York City like me, and she's an internist who specializes in obesity and metabolic disease, and Dr. Vidya Lori, who's an endocrinologist, and she's a blogger. She has a new blog, um, which she's going to tell us about, with recipes. It, it's awesome, actually. I was checking it out. And she works with many patients with obesity and diabetes. And and I should make a point, Vidya has a book that's going to be coming out at some point in the near future, which is very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to both of you. Thank you. So why don't we start, Alexandra, why don't you answer first, and then Vidya, what do you do on a day-to-day basis? What's your specialty like? So I am uh, first a mom, which I I think I should start with. I am a mom of two young boys, so my day starts at home. But my professional life, I am both an internist and an obesity medicine specialist, and I love preventing disease. So in my uh, clinic, I help people to improve their metabolic health, be it through weight loss. So we prevent all of the diseases that are associated with excess weight, or I help people get off diabetes medication through weight loss and dietary changes. I believe that metabolic health is very complex, and so I, I come at it from every angle. Um, first lifestyle and nutrition, and then I look at the whole of a person to understand their medical complexities, and, and sometimes we use medications to help people achieve optimal results. Um, but my, my day is, is quite varied, but I tend to focus on uh, metabolic health patients and uh, help people improve their life through, through nutrition and healthy lifestyle changes. 
That's fabulous. And Vidya, how about you? So like Alexandria, I'm also a mom first. I have two little ones, but I practice in San Antonio at the Texas Diabetes Institute, and I'm an adult endocrinologist here, and and I work full-time seeing patients, and the majority of my practice is diabetes. And the majority of my practice is type two diabetes, type two diabetes, and those patients really, really battle with several issues besides the diabetes, including obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. So, so I manage those patients, and that definitely includes lifestyle changes, diet changes, um, as well as medication. Well, that is, you know, that's such an important thing to do because, as we all know. Um, diabetes can have such profound negative consequences when it's not well controlled. Um, you know, it's it's sadly not a singular entity, so to speak, um, over time, right? I mean, it can really get very hard. And so many people suffer from it. Um, and I mean, I remember being a, a med student in the A1C clinic, and it was insane, which is um, a marker of, I guess it's can I say it's a marker of severity of illness? I don't know. What do you guys think? It sure is. I, you know, in Texas, especially, I know you all are from New York, but in Texas, it's a huge epidemic. I was trained in Chicago, and when I, when I moved out here, I mean, the amount of patients and what was really profound is how young the patients were that were developing diabetes and issues with obesity and hyperlipidemia and everything that goes along with it. So it's a huge epidemic here. Now, how, you know, we're going to talk about this a little later, but I think just what, what do you guys say, um, video, we can start with you, you know, the people who say, well, I try to lose weight, but, you know, mm-hmm. my family, we all eat a lot and we, you know, I do everything, but the weight never budges. You know, the people who basically say like, they right. throw their hands up and say, mm, I tried, but can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that actually is almost the majority. I mean, some patients come in and say, well, I know I'm doing the wrong thing, so fix me. But the majority of people say, you know, I'm really trying, but I can't do it. So those are the patients I spend more time with. I I sit down with them and not only do I take a diet history where I ask, okay, what are you eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? What are your snacks? What are you drinking? But I also ask what they're doing because I think that that impacts the dietary choices they make and even the timing of what they make. So if it's, if it's like somebody who's with their family all the time and she's cooking for a family of six and she's just trying to get food on the table, her intervention is going to be different from let's say somebody who's on the road all the time and driving through, you know, restaurants or fast food places to get their meals But whenever people kind of say, I've done everything, there's nothing else I can do to lose weight, more often than not, I find something that that we can change to help them lose weight. But I think it takes time. You know, I mean, this isn't something that you can do in a 20-minute office visit when you're managing every single thing. But you have to sit down with their patient and and take kind of like a a day history is what I call it. Like, okay, what time do you wake up? What did you do? Then what did you eat? And usually when I take that kind of history, I can find an area that needs improvement. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Even I have to imagine things like, you know, soda, right? You drink enough soda in a day and can really undermine anything else. Now, Alexandra, how about you? When you have patients who come in and they're like, you know, I've tried, you tell me what to eat, but I'm going to tell you I already tried. How do you kind of deal with that? Well, there there are a few things. You know, most people think um, that you can only lose weight by eating less and exercising more. And that model is flawed. Firstly, it's more than just nutrition that can add uh, to excess weight. So maybe someone's not sleeping enough. Maybe they have sleep apnea. They're not getting good sleep. Maybe stress levels are out of control. You know, weight is put on and comes off. It's very dynamic. It's not static. And so there's so many contributors in our world that might lead to weight gain or inability to take off weight. Beyond that, I think the traditional way that we in medicine and in the Western world have 
told people to lose weight has been flawed. So, you know, to repeat myself, this whole idea that just eat less, exercise more, it doesn't work for everyone. And also the concept of low fat is the best diet. And this is the diet that the United States has followed for the past three years. It's, it's, it's not working for us. So often mm-hmm. people really aren't eating a lot and I follow their food diaries and what they need is not eat less, they need to eat differently. So it's, it's often actually increasing fats, healthy fats, you know, increasing protein, decreasing the carbohydrates. Our bodies burn fuel differently. So it's often finding the right fuel for a person. It's funny, you, you know, in terms of the f- fat content, I, I remember being a kid and my mom always, you know, buying like snack wells because they were quote low fat. <laughs> and right. but, if, but eating too. nuts, no. yeah, yeah, but eating nuts too. was like a big no-no. <laughs> you know, if, if one of us wanted to eat nuts, it was like, oh my God, you're going to get fat. Whereas now, such a shifting dynamic. Now I would never... <laughs> Well, I don't think I'd go and buy snack wells if you paid me, but I eat nuts like they're going yeah. out of style. Um, well, so then I guess a follow-up question, um, Alexandra, I'll ask you first. What role does exercise play in all of this? Exercise is incredibly important. It, it's very important for your cardiovascular health. But study after study shows that exercise does not lead to weight loss. It is Weight loss is 98% what you're putting into your body, what you're eating. Exercise comes into play and is very important once you start losing the weight. And that's for a few reasons. Once you start to lose weight, your basal metabolic rate starts to decrease and you need less calories. And it's hard. that's why it's hard to keep weight off. And people, you know, we say yo-yo dieting or the technical term is weight cycling. But we need to try to increase that that metabolic rate, and one way to do that is through exercise. And the other reason that it's important to exercise once you start losing, you need to build up muscle mass. So when a person starts to lose weight, you lose both fat and muscle. And it's really important to build up your muscle mass. Now, separate from the weight world, exercise is very important for mental health, for your your healthy bones, for your healthy heart. But you can't out-exercise a bad diet. And Vidya, how about you? Do most of your patients voluntarily exercise or is this something you really have to push hard for? It's certainly something that I have to push for. And it's also, you know, people consider different things exercise. You know, a lot of my patients will say, well, I walk around the block, so I definitely exercise. And I'm like, "Mm, that's not enough. But I agree with Alexandra. I, I mean, it's diet. Diet is the key for weight loss. You know, I think I have too many patients that come to me and when we discuss weight, they're like, oh, I just need to exercise more. Or, you know, I I ate this Starbucks latte, so I just did an extra 20 minutes on the treadmill. Doesn't work that way. Um, (laughs) So although exercise is important for all the things that Alexandra, uh, uh, you know, outlined mental health, you know, body composition in terms of gaining muscle mass. Um, you know, for your bone mineral density, I am an endocrinologist. It's incredibly important. We have to do it. And even just for physical conditioning, you know, I have so many patients that are just, they're using walkers and, you know, they, they, they really don't move very much, but it's diet primarily that, in, that controls what their current weight is. But it's, it's definitely hard to get my patients to diet or exercise. <laughs> And on the flip I, side, one, one yeah. little caveat to that is that exercise, you, we should be exercising from the start. So if we can prevent excess weight, if we can prevent weight gain in our children, that, that's the place to be. I, I really mm-hmm. wish I were out of a job and no one ever had to come see me. Um, so exercise and that, because I, I don't want people to walk away and say, hey, these doctors said we don't have to exercise. But, <laughs> you know, it's a way to prevent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very- 
Excellent point. And that is, you know, we have to take a break, but this is a excellent point to leave this segment with. Still exercise. It's good for you. Um, we have to take a brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking with doctors Alexandra Soa and Vidya Ilori. And after the break, we are going to talk about diet from pregnancy through breastfeeding and how that starts the process of impacting our kids um, and what we can do to kind of maximize things in terms of health for our kids. And so we're going to focus with Dr. Alexandra Sola right after the break. Intergenerational programming is uniting America due to the tireless efforts of Dr. Ramona Frischman. Retired from the Miami-Dade County Public School System, Dr. Frischman continues to develop intergenerational learning programs aimed to improve the lives of children, young adults, and seniors through unique strategies and public policy in order to establish a mutually supportive agenda. She views intergenerational programs as a resource for policymakers and the general public on economic, social, and personal initiatives that govern our society. Her work bridges the generational gap, providing many individuals the opportunity to explore areas of common ground and celebrate each other's diversity. Contact Ramona Frischman at RamonaLong at AOL.com or visit www.gu.org to learn more about intergenerational programming. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to Drs. Vidya Lori and Alexandra Soa. And if you have a question, you can give us a call, 866-451-1451. So this section, we are going to explore healthy eating for our kids and for our families, for ourselves, and how our actions and choices really impact them from pregnancy onwards with Dr. Alexandra Soa. And then after the next break, we're going to talk diabetes and weight loss plus recipes with Vidya Elori. So Alexandra, talk to me about Mm -hmm. why it matters what one eats during pregnancy as it relates to our children. I mean, aren't we the ones who absorb it? Aren't we the ones who are basically getting, putting on the weight or not? Well, you would think so. Um, you know, even though I'm an adult uh, physician, I only treat adults. When I became pregnant with my first son, I started to do a deep dive about the research, about what I was eating and how it was impacting my pregnancy. And it's really fascinating. There's something called a prenatal flavor learning. And at 28 weeks of gestation, a baby's smell and uh, sensory tract is fully developed. And they have taste buds, and they start tasting everything that you're eating. So we know that babies who are fed food uh, that their mothers eat consistently will favor that sort of food after they're out in the world, whether it's through breast milk or actual solid food. There's a fascinating study about women who ate carrots during pregnancy consistently. Those babies, five months, at age five months, when they're eating their first solid food, preferred carrot-flavored food over any other food. That's crazy. I know. (laughs) So that does speak, of course, to the benefit of eating healthfully when you're pregnant. Um, How can we kind of maximize that health as kids get older, right? Because I, I can at least speak for my kids. Each of them is very different in terms of their food preferences, but... Um, you know, I remember with my oldest, we, 
we kind of exposed him to every food under the sun and he ate everything under the sun. And then now he, you know, at 11, he'll eat mac and cheese, pizza <laughs> and cucumbers. I, um, no, the, the we sort of failed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, kids are kids and humans have choices and they have preference changes and our palate changes. But one of the most important things that we can do as parents of young children is to expose them to as many flavors as possible and to start with the healthy foods and to stay away from the processed foods because research does show that children who are exposed to a wide variety of vegetables as their first food, foods and then in childhood do grow up to be healthier adults with more normalized weight. Um, I think the best thing that, that parents can do with their kids as they get older is to all eat the same food, make the same meal, eat the same meal. I sometimes don't want to have broccoli. My kids are making my kids eat it. Now, does that make any sense? Why would my children want to eat broccoli if their mom's not eating it? And so I try to make a really conscious decision to make one meal for the whole family. And when my children were just starting to eat, I would take a few components of the meal that I was making for everybody and puree it or make it into very small, mushy pieces. But now we eat the same foods, even spicy foods. It's, it's important for me that my kids are willing to try new things and they, they get incrementally different flavors and, and textures because we know that children who are eat more than one or two foods do grow up to eat more healthfully. So the more that we can do to expose children to new tastes and flavors and textures, it's the better for them. But remember that kids reject foods all the time. And it can take up to 20 exposures to the same flavor for a child to become accustomed to it. So yes, consistency is also key. Now, when, you know, when you have a family, for example, in terms of eating together and such, when you have obesity run in the family, Mm-hmm. Is that purely genetic? Is that because everyone's eating the same food? Is it all of the above? And, you know, the correlate to that is, as a parent, if we're in that scenario, how can we help our children to eat healthy foods without kind of creating a complex for them or making, it, you know, making food something that becomes a negative? Right. Right. And- such an important um, question. So I I will be honest, I have a family history of obesity, of uh, diabetes in my family. And so that was something that I grew up with an awareness of. And it's probably why I picked my specialty. How can I prevent this within my own family and my own world? First answer your question about, is it all genetics? So obesity, as I like to define it, is a complex disease that's multifactorial. So yes, there is a genetic component, but it's also behavioral, it's environmental, it's, uh, there's psych involved in it. It it has to do with what you're eating, but it has to do with, you know, who's around you. So it's not just genetic. So if you come from a family where people struggle with excess weight, that does not mean that you will have the same health state and you can make changes within your your own world. Uh, One of the interesting things that I just think is so fascinating within the field is this concept of the human microbiome. And the microbiome is trillions of bacteria that live within us, and most of them are healthy, but some of them are bad, and they live within our gut. And we're learning more and more every year, really, it's rapid research that probably some of what the genetics of obesity are really have to do with our inherited microbiome. So if you are around people with similar bacterial genetic makeup, you might have the same sort of health outcomes in the end. So when we're talking about exposing children to lots of food palettes and flavors and, and why vegetables are important, that supports a healthy gut microbiome. So it's it's not just genetics, and you can you know there are so many things that we're learning that are are more complex than just oh you're born with it and you're just you know big boned or you know people say 
I just have to, everyone else in the family looks like this, so I just accept it. So I tell all of my patients that I've never really focused on a number on the scale or I will never use you know, words like in my home, I'll never use the word fat. You know, I will never use that word. I always focus things on healthy. So let's make healthy choices. Let's focus on health. With my children, we go to the farm. We live in New York City, so it's not very close, but we'll go to a farm and we'll learn about where our food is coming from. And we try to eat healthy foods and go to the farmer's market together and we go pick apples. We will go together to learn about how our food comes to our table and we try to make the healthiest, most, most natural choices. Now, of course, they eat pizza, and of course, we have food that's, you know, quick and easy, and, you know, we have some things that come out of a box, but on the whole, I like to focus on health, you know, you'll grow strong, (laughs) you know, you'll be, you'll be a stronger athlete, you'll grow tall, you know, you will think more clearly in school, so it's not about focusing on weight, um, especially in my house and what I encourage my patients do especially if a parent has a lot of weight to lose and they are going on a new way of eating they are going on a diet i encourage them to bring the family along but not to restrict you know just say this is for my health and this is for your health so it, it, it's a, it's it is sometimes a struggle and i think people should be aware of not encouraging complexes and it should never be for a goal of being skinny um but but healthy that's such a you know such a good message, right? It's I, I saw somewhere the other day something that said like skinny is the new healthy, right? That the goal no longer should be about looking like a you know what one imagines a cover model would look like. Instead, it's about being healthy. But that then begs my next question for you: being can someone be obese and healthy at once? Uh, again, another complex question. So. Even if, so how do we define health? I define it as emotional, physical, mental well-being. And even if a person checks all of those boxes and I draw labs and everything looks okay, I know as a physician that a person who is obese, and that is defined by a a few things, um, if a person is obese, while they might be healthy today, in 20, 30 years, if they keep that same weight, they are at a significantly increased risk of developing many uh, diseases from diabetes to hypertension to joint problems to cancer. So yes and no is my answer. (laughs) I mean, it's a fair answer. Um, I mean, I guess maybe I should ask before even that, can you define really like obesity has a specific definition, but I think a lot of people are pretty unclear as to where one go, you know, what, what point one becomes obese? Is it a scale thing? Is it BMI? Like what marker is most important? Most commonly, and at your doctor's office, BMI is used as a marker of obesity. So a BMI, which is a a ratio of your height to your weight, um, a BMI over 30 is obese. And then we have different classifications uh, of obesity. A BMI over 27 is overweight. Now, 75% of our country has a BMI of 27 or higher. So three quarters of our country right now is, are overweight or obese. So what people think is overweight now is becoming very skewed because it's, oh, no, no, I'm not obese. Yes, but everyone else around is, is gaining weight too. Um, so we use BMI most commonly, but it's not a perfect metric because it doesn't take into consideration your activity, your muscle mass. It, it's not perfect. So we use other markers. Um, we use waist circumference, and uh, that can pick up obesity and metabolic disease when a BMI might be normal. And the third metric, which is most sensitive, has to look at the body composition of fat to muscle and, and how much a person has. And this is all... These all differ. The waist circumference and the, the body composition differ for men and women. It's such an interesting point you made about our country because we are in not the healthiest country to say the least. Yet there's such a focus here on 
food, on fitness, on all of these things. Whereas you go to France and people are much, they are apparently healthier, but they don't seem to be as obsessive is maybe the better word about food. It's an interesting thing, right? But unfortunately, we have to take a break right at this moment. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to doctors Vidya Lori and Alexandra Soa. And after the break, we're going to explore more about diabetes and obesity with Dr. Vidya Lori. Stay with us. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomenon while relaying it in an easy to understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her book and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305-705-3428 or email her at renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru way. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet Meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Dupula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Center, and we are speaking to doctors Alexandra Soa and Dr. Vidya Ilori. And before the break, we had a really interesting conversation with Alexandra about food choices and the impact these can have now and in the future. And now we're going to shift gears a bit and talk to Dr. Vidya Ilori. And I want to remind you that give, you can give us a call if you have any questions. The number is 866-451-1451. So, Vidya What's your top way, you know, so people come to you and they say, um, Mm -hmm. you know, they have diabetes, they have whatever metabolic disorders, they need to lose weight. Is there one diet that you find to be more effective than others? Right. So I think that there's two different questions. There's a question of which diet is optimal for overall health and then which diet is optimal to lose weight. So I think in terms of losing weight for my specific population, since I'm seeing so many diabetics lowering the carbs in their diet and changing that macronutrient content really helps with weight loss. I also prescribe something called intermittent fasting where, and it can also be known as time nutrition where you um, have all your meals within an eight hour time period and actually fast for 16 hours. In the group of patients that I see, which is mostly type 2 diabetics, they have high levels of insulin resistance, which is, which is in part um, causing the weight gain and the obesity. So the intermittent fasting combined with a low-carb diet reduces the exogenous insulin levels in the body, which can improve insulin resistance, and that will help with weight loss. So for my patient population, I primarily focus on lowering the carbohydrate carbohydrate content of their of their meals but it's really individualized um i have to see where they're starting from i mean i have some patients that have tried every diet in the book and they're not seeing results so they're starting at a different point where i have another patient 
who is consuming soda kind of at every meal, multiple times through the day, you know, often snacking. So I think intervention is going to be different depending on where you're starting from. Um, but those are the two main ideas I try to stick in the first visit is lowering the carbohydrates and then as well as this intermittent fasting. And can you explain, so for intermittent fasting, is that something someone Mm -hmm. would do for a month, for two months, for a year? Like how long is this? So this is uh, long term. This is is something that, that I recommend to my patients to do every day if they can. I mean, this is, this would be their new normal. And if you really think about it, it it should be the way we're eating. So if you're fasting for 16 hours, and this includes sleep. So so say, you know, you consume all your meals between nine and five, that really is the way we should all be eating anyway. I mean, you've got, you know, breakfast around nine, maybe something small at noon, and then try to finish up dinner before five. I mean, you can certainly change these eight hours. But this is something that I recommend every day for my patients forever. This is a lifestyle change. Um, And, you know, what I recommend to my patients isn't anything that's like a short-term fix, but this is something I specifically recommend to my diabetics. And it works. And and for the people who can stick with it, it it really does work. And, of course, there's going to be days that you can't, and that's okay. You just pick up and fast the next day. This is actually something that I do every day as well. And... Are there any risks to it? You know, I think in our patient population, we have to be careful because um, there are patients who are on medications that cause hypoglycemia, of course. So if you're fasting and you develop hypoglycemia, you have, you've got to treat that. But fasting for 16 hours really isn't that long. Um, so in terms of like long-term risk, sometimes people ask me about like starvation ketosis, which you really don't see for until like 48 hours of fasting. Um, but other than making sure that your medications are appropriately dosed for this, for an adult um, and a non-pregnant, non-lactating woman, uh, intermittent fasting is, is fine. And is there a... When you do that, does that mean someone can eat whatever they want? Should they be maximum? I mean, you were saying low carb, (laughs) but beyond low carb, but like, does this mean bacon is okay? I mean, where's the... You know, exactly, right? And everyone can interpret this very differently. And there's so many fad diets right now that, you know, like people do the ketogenic diet, which some people kind of call the bacon diet. And and that is not something that I agree with. Um, So... So I recommend a low-carb diet in terms of macronutrients, but I also recommend getting your food from good sources and having high-quality food and reducing animal fats. And this is why I do take each patient into consideration. If I've got a patient who has cardiovascular disease as well as diabetes, I'm not going to recommend a very high animal fat diet to help them lose the weight. Although an animal, you know, these ketogenic diets really do help people lose weight. But I think there's still the question and what the cardiovascular, long-term cardiovascular outcome is for following a diet like that. But I recommend the intermittent fasting, low carb. And I guess I would say if I had to choose a category of the type of diet I recommend to people, I would say Mediterranean. Um, but you know, I, am definitely careful with these fads and, and I do think the content, it's not just the timing or, or the macronutrients. I think the type of food that we're eating is very important. I, I agree with you 100%. And mm-hmm. unfortunately not everybody has the availability for, you know, either because of cost or other things. Um, sure, but it makes such a huge difference. I mean, it really, um, you know, processed food is also just so bad. <laughs> um, it is. I mean, there's so many things in there. You don't even know what's in there. <laughs> now, one quick, one thing I think it's important that we touch on is, are there other underlying conditions that you check for, that you rule out in advance of embarking on, you know, kind of a health, you know, journey with patients where they're trying to lose weight, maintain weight, what have you, what specifically do you have to make sure they don't have or they do have? Sure. You know, 
as an endocrinologist, when someone comes in with me and their, their primary concern is weight gain or difficulty to lose weight, there are several hormonal disorders that I do screen for to make sure we're just not fighting against something. And these include Cushing's disease, hypothyroidism, growth hormone excess. I also screen for PCOS. And even diabetes itself, I mean, it puts people in this insulin resistant state that makes people prone for weight gain. So I definitely look for these underlying causes and treat those before we embark on a weight loss journey. And how about, I mean, do most people, by the time they get to you, they know they're diabetic, right? I mean, you, right. do you typically make, they, you're not making the diagnosis, but do you find that um, once people start to get healthier, that they're more inclined to um, follow the diet? You know, like, is there a positive reinforcement that happens? Or conversely, is, is it like they I, get to their point and they're like, woohoo, I'm done. Right. And I think we see both. I mean, I see patients who get on the diet I prescribe and they feel good. They have so much more energy and they see their numbers go down and then um, they stick with it. And they find that it's relatively easy to follow once you get used to it. Um, there are definitely patients who life happens and there's a stressor and they'll fall off. So I have several patients like that, actually, where we get them to go and we'll get them off insulin, let's say, and their A1Cs are great. They're in the sixes. And then three months later, they come back and the A1Cs is eight. And I'm like, well, what happened? You know, and, and nine times out of 10, something happened. A family member died or, or there was an accident. Um, so it is something that's difficult to, you know, if you have to stick with, you know, once you have insulin resistance and diabetes, and you get off insulin, let's say, or you get off medicines because you're following a good diet. Once you don't follow that diet anymore, the disease does come back. Um, but I, I would really say my patients who have stuck with it and have seen that success, they love the way it feels. They love the way it feels to be healthier. So they, they stick with it. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, it feels good to have energy and you know, to feel good in your own skin. How do you mm -hmm. um, approach it? When, you know, I think it can become very almost addicting, right? Someone starts to lose weight. They get a lot of positive reinforcement. Everyone's like, oh, you look awesome. Do you ever mm -hmm. run into the issue where now you have a patient who's become overly obsessed, overly focused on the scale? And if so, what do you do? How do you approach that? Mm, again, I, I mean, th that can happen. And, and even I, I definitely have patients that are obsessive about the number on the scale. But I like to uh, approach it. I like to remove the numbers and, and say, let's focus on your overall health. And, and let's figure out why we're still doing this and, and what your goals are. You know, and, and I tell them it, weight is just a number that's influenced by so many things, right? I, I mean, it could be you know, how much salt you consume the night before, you know, you know, just different days in your cycle, depending on, you know, if you're a woman and you're, you're still menstruating. So I like to take the focus off of just numbers and just focus on how they're feeling and, you know, how much more energy they have and what their well-being is like and how much more active they are and the things they can do now that they couldn't do before because they're stronger and healthier and that usually helps. I, I would say in my patient, um, you know, with my patient population where I'm located in San Antonio, I I don't have that problem a, a lot. I, I mean, for the most part, I just have, it, it's, it's hard for me to have my patients stick to the diet as is. Um, I would say I only have a handful that become kind of obsessive about the numbers and, and the weight, but I still get that. I just try to bring them back and um, try to focus more on health versus the actual number on the scale. I mean, it seems like a very smart way to approach it, right? Because you don't want to dissuade mm -hmm. someone from being healthy, but you also don't want to feed into their, um, what could become an issue. Um, right. And do people, do you find that when people come back 
do they say their family's doing the same or do they feel isolated? So I have a couple, I, I would say I see both. And, you know, obviously when the whole family kind of follows a healthy eating pattern together, the patient is more successful. So I have multiple patients that take what we discussed during the office visit and they take my recipes and they go home and they share it with their family. And then later I find that their kids are cooking my recipes and it's like this wonderful, I mean, it makes makes me feel awesome, frankly, you know, to see that the whole family is following this new lifestyle. Um, I do every now and then have a patient who comes in who says, I'm sick of making two dinners. You know, I make one for myself and I make one for my spouse and my children and it's just not working for me and they're getting mad at me. Um, I think that family support is so important for a lifestyle improvement journey. Um, so, so families I do help both. out. Well, we have to take another brief break. You're listening to MD for Moms on iHeartRadio and the BBM Global Network. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and after the break, we're going to talk more about health. Don't go away. Horses, mystical, present, past, and future, all in one. Wild, free, domestic, and healing for everyone. Betty Hames knows this and has put her horses to good use with Nature Connect Equine Coaching. Her mission is to help people affected by the loss of hope and trust in their lives and to rediscover the wonders of nature through nature-connected learning so they can rebuild their lives and live peacefully with newfound hope, trust, and joy. Betty Hames is also a certified elite life coach, a Washington State certified counselor, and chemical dependency professional. She is passionate about partnering nature with healing, and through horses, she sees amazing results and transformation in lives that might have otherwise been lost. Call 509-830-9225 and visit her at HamesLifeCoaching.com. Hold your horses. You're in for the ride of your life. Welcome back to MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio and iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder, and today we are speaking to endocrinologist Dr. Vidya Lori, an obesity medicine specialist and internist, Dr. Alexandra Soa. And so one thing that you know you both mentioned was cooking, right? And making your own food. Um Alexandra, how do you incorporate that for your patients? Do you just suggest that they go and cook? Do you give them recipes? What's your approach? Yes, I have a a bit of a a different uh, medical office where I get to have some extra time with my patients. And I do teach people how to cook and I hold their hand and give recipes. Now, I think it's important that people need to develop their own meal planning because I can't tell what they prefer, but I do provide them with recipes that I think are in line with what they should be eating. But more than that, what I try to encourage people is that I think in this day of Instagram, when everything's really beautiful and food is plated amazingly and recipes are complex, people are very scared of just simple cooking. So I like to peel it back and remind people that you know, not every meal has to be spectacular. Not every meal has to be the most amazing, took two hours to cook, is the best thing you've ever tasted. Like, it's okay to have a piece of grilled chicken breast and some steamed vegetables, you know, with some butter on top. It's it's, it's easy go-tos are what I try to get my patients to embrace and what in my own family I embrace. I think that's so cool. Now, Vidya, how about you? You you have a blog where you do recipes and the books do your patients like your blog do they check it out and use the cooking they do. Rec- that's it's, so cool it's, it's great actually you know so i do have a blog it's called doctorspantry.org and i post healthy recipes for diabetics um and when my patient sees me they get a handout on dietary recommendations and a link to my blog and my instagram and it's wonderful. They legitimately follow me and comment on the recipes. And I have several patients that try things out and repost it. I just, it creates a really nice community. And I, I think it empowers my patients, you know, to be able to create food on their own that's healthy and delicious. 
Um, and they really do like it and it's effective and it kind of helps me to stay in contact with my patients in between visits. Um, I kind of always joke with that and I'm, I'm like, well, I'm going to see you in three months, but you're going to see a post from me tomorrow. So it's kind of like this constant reminder <laughs> as well that you should be eating healthy. You should be following what Dr. Lurie <laughs> said. Um, so it's really cool. I, you know, and my, my kids are getting super involved too, which is fun. I, my son, especially he's four and he likes taking pictures of the food with me. He likes plating stuff with me. I'm actually coming out with the children's cookbook in the next couple of months. And it's going to be illustrated where I, um, I actually am illustrating it where I draw out each of the steps, like cartoon um, pictures of, you know, like bananas and vanilla, stuff like that. So it's going to be a children's cookbook with like a pictorial instruction for each recipe. But it's really fun. I, I mean, it's kind of my hobby outside of work, but I've incorporated it into my work, you know, with these healthy diabetic recipes and the patients really seem seem to like it. That's fabulous. I'm looking forward to checking it out. I'm, yeah. I, and anyone who listens to the show knows that I'm the first to say I'm a terrible cook, but I'm always open to uh, a clear recipe that I can't screw up too easily because while I can bake, I just can't cook. Figure that one out. Um, now, yeah. Alexandra, we'll start with you. If, if you have a um, could think of like a salient point, a real big hitter from today. What would you like our listeners to walk away with? Oh, well, first let me say that Vidya's uh, recipes and pictures are amazing. I do follow her on Instagram and she always makes them oh. free and it looks amazing. So everyone else should check it out too. Um, so. Yeah, the pictures, by the way, before I, I'm going to cut you off for one sec, Vidya, those photographs are beautiful also. I mean, the recipes oh look delicious. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. I know, I'm also <laughs> talented. I'm very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, my takeaway point is that you never have to accept where you are. And you know, life is a journey. And it, we should focus on our health. And just because you have not succeeded in the past about making healthy changes, maybe you just need to think about it differently. And so I really encourage people to not ignore health problems and to go to their doctor regularly and to listen to advice and to, you know, really think about what your priorities are. Um, I think that a lot of disease in this country can be prevented or reversed through lifestyle. Um, we, we really underestimate the power of food, sleep, stress, and movement in this country, and we have um, focused a little bit too much on the treatment of the disease. Now, as a physician, I, of course, utilize medications, and I think modern medicine is amazing, but I really would love people to focus more on the prevention, and, and sometimes it's tedious, and sometimes it's hard work, but it will pay off, and every day in my practice, I see the positive of that hard work. So, um, yeah, just don't accept where you are today if you have room for improvement. And we all do. Definitely. Good point. And Vidya, how about you? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I have to add is food can be medicine, too. The, only, the great thing about food is there's no side effects, right? So as much as we are physicians and People think I love to prescribe medications. Um, I actually like to remove medications. So that's the key thing that I, I'd like everyone to take home from this is food can be medicine for so many different medical disorders, and it doesn't have the same side effects of all the medicines that we get from the pharmacy. So it's what we can do with changing our lifestyle and our dietary habits. We should do that first. Um, and the medications come later. So, so important, such an important message, because I think, you know, there's always been a push on identifying the issue and uh, making a diagnosis and treating, but the underlying, you know, issues sometimes are ignored. And then people think that it, you have to be on like 10 medicines to get better. And mm -hmm. depending on the scenario, you know, there are so many lifestyle changes, food included, 
that make a huge difference. Obviously, we're all physicians, so we all believe in the benefit of medicine where it's appropriate. But sometimes people look for a quick fix and they want to have a pill that makes life easier or makes you thinner or makes you have more energy. And that pill is in your fridge. It's not a pill. It's Mm -hmm. food and making smarter choices, which I think we've learned so much about. Now, Vidya, if someone wants to find your blog and your website and you, how should they do so? So my website is doctorspantry.org. Um, I also have an Instagram handle, doctors underscore pantry. And then I also have a Facebook page called Doctors Pantry. So if you Google my name and Doctors Pantry, one of those will come up. <laughs> but, you know, anybody feel free to message me through any of those social media, you know, you know, avenues, whether it be just to if you're in Texas and, you know, you want to be seen as a patient or if you just want to chat about nutrition or really anything, um, you know, people do message me and, and I'm grateful for that because then it lets me know that people are listening and looking. So yeah, any of those three ways would be great. Awesome. And how about you, Alexandra? You can find me across all platforms at Alexandra Soa MD, including a website. I have recently opened um, a new medical practice in New York City called So Well Health. And the website is forthcoming, but um, it will be up, and it's linked to alexandrasoamd.com. Um, in my practice, I also offer telehealth consultations um, where I can do a deep dive uh, with patients and, and kind of go further about the things we talked about in this podcast. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Thank you to our listeners. Remember, every Wednesday, 1 p.m. on the BBM Global Network. And uh, you can also, don't forget, download, if you missed any of this or any old shows, download on iTunes. This has been an episode of MD for Moms on the BBM Global Network and iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. And until next time, be well, enjoy life, and thanks for listening. You've been listening to MD for Moms with your host, Dr. Carly Snyder. Please join us each and every week for answers to the many challenging issues moms face today on the next episode of Dr. Carly's MD for Moms. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.